Capcom Cup has not even begun yet, but the drama has already started. Let me explain. You see, Capcom Cup X is coming up this weekend, starting with the LCQ. The first Street Fighter 6 CPT season is coming to a head, and it's a historic moment, not just for Street Fighter, but for fighting games as a whole, as this is a tournament with over $2 million in prizing, with $1 million going to first place. By far the biggest prize pool the FGC has ever seen. It's not even close. And, you know, we're already starting off with, you know, uh, kind of a, a letdown, a letdown. We see. Uh, this message here from the official Street Fighter account just yesterday. Congratulations to the talented players who will be competing to be the first Street Fighter 6 Capcom Cup champion, as we will be focused on the competition at hand. We like to provide advance notice that there won't be any new gameplay or content reveals at Capcom Cup X. However, there will be more esports news coming at Capcom X, so stay tuned. So pretty disappointing news to see. Uh, a lot of people are pretty upset at the extremely slow rate that the DLC content and updates have become to Street Fighter VI. A lot of players are a little bit uh, frustrated with the current meta of the game and are looking for something to freshen it up in terms of a balance patch. Generally, big balance patches tend to come right after Capcom Cup seasons conclude. So this is the first time in a long time since Street Fighter V has been the main game where the Capcom Cup season is not finishing and we're immediately going into a balance patch. I mean, there's been years where literally Capcom Cup finishes after the balance patch goes live. The balance patch goes live a few hours early. So this is very disappointing news. No news on new DLC characters. They already uh, announced Ed and Akuma is not going to be until spring. So it's a super slow schedule. So for a lot of more casual fans, especially, they uh, felt with this post that there's not too much for them to look forward to. And it was very disappointing for myself as well, but at least we have the million dollar tournament to look forward to and some gourmet games ahead of us, which is obviously something that I'm very interested in. So we've had players from all over the world competing to qualify, and these players have been uh, primarily qualifying through online events. A lot of this has been region locked online events where generally you have about two players per region from regions divvied up around the world qualifying with only a handful of offline qualifiers. We had uh, Angry Bird from Evo. Uh, Gachikun from the offline premiere in Singapore and Chris Wong from the offline premiere in in France. Those are the only three offline qualifiers uh, alongside the LCQ winner who will be crowned this weekend right before Capcom Cup begins. So it's a bit different from previous years. Uh, Capcom Cup 2019 was the final like a formal year we had before COVID shut things down for a while. And back then we used to have offline tournaments around the world, primarily offline. There was some online mixed in there where players would compete for points and that would establish a leaderboard. The better you did at the online events, the more points you would get. And that would rank players throughout the season based on their performances and the number of points they had. You can see here, Punk, you know, he was dominating the Street Fighter file like no, nobody's business. 4,815 points there. And then you can see once you even hit like fifth place here, Hot Dog, uh, 2,150 points, a steep drop off from there. So it was clear who the best players were through the season, and they would use these points to then generate a bracket, seeding the bracket based on the points. So the number one player would play the number uh, 32 player, and the second player would play rank number 31, so on and so forth, so that the best players wouldn't have to play each other round one right away, and that there can be a rising uh, arc of action as the best players work towards each other to ideally meet in the finals unless there's any upsets along the way and you know upsets are a feature not a bug and it adds to the excitement of the whole ordeal so considering we switched to primarily online region lock tournaments due to how the format was done in 2022 because of primarily covid and kind of a leftover artifact of that since we've moved uh into this hybrid model with a few offline events but 99 percent primarily online events how is this going to be handled? Well, in 2022, the final Capcom Cup for Street Fighter V, the return to actual Capcom Cups, they did this format where since everything was region locked, they divvied up into group stages. Now, instead of 32 players, there's 48 players and the regions were not seated since there's no intermingling of competition. You don't really have a way to rank a player from region A with a player from region B. There's no comparison to be had because most of the events are in these isolated areas. So what they did was to prevent players from the same region from you know, going the whole year than having to play each other in the same group. They did randomized drawings, but broke players out based on this regional seating. So they would prevent two players from America from being in the same group, two players from South America being in the same group. So that way there can be variety and cross pollination of players from different regions. So this format was once again brought to the current Capcom Cup. And we have Robin Wrench here, who's in this Powerball 
lottery number drawing device here where they literally put the the names of the players on the balls themselves as they're bouncing around and they would draw players to put into the groups and they would do it in order based on regions so they would go through north america to put in, in group a b c d so on and so forth and then you can see here now they're going to central america so this way they prevent you know training partners from playing each other and that led to some interesting results like this group here group e snake eyes the lone zangief representative in capcom cup has a group with three dj players in it namikaze out of brazil fudo from japan and cien from singapore uh three of the best to ever do it um uh, especially fudo and cien namikaze has been dominating in brazil i think he's gonna do really well at capcom cup but, you know, apparently DJ is not the worst matchup for, for Zangief. So maybe Snake Eyes will have this matchup down to a science and, uh, and make it happen and get out of the group. Uh, another really interesting group, Group C. We have Knuckle Dew in here, and uh, I'm rooting for Knuckle Dew to go far. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm definitely looking for USA to do some work at this Capcom Cup. But he has literally half of the JPs in Capcom Cup in this group. There's four JPs total now in Capcom Cup. And he has Dookie and DCQ, who are, in my opinion, the two strongest JPs in the entire bracket. And Guile traditionally does not do very well against JP. Knuckle Dew has a Guile, uh, a Kami, which is what he actually used to beat Banana Can, the best uh, North American JP to get into Capcom Cup. So he can do it, but kind of a, a tough draw, I would say, for Knuckle Dew. And then we have the main group in question, which if you're watching this video, there's a chance you already know why this video is being made. We're moving on to Group F, which begins with Mena RD and Kaba being pulled into the same group. So, as I mentioned before, regions uh, would you're prevented from having multiple people from one region in the same group. However, this year Mena RD actually moved to the northeastern part of the United States, so he qualified out of the U.S. East region, while Kaba, his longtime training partner from the Dominican Republic qualified out of the Central American region, which includes DR. So, you know, two training partners who have been competing and traveling the world with each other and taking their craft to the highest levels for years and years and years together are being forced to have a team kill. Same sponsor, same region, everything, but based on the technicalities of where they qualify through, they're forced to be into the same group. So that's definitely a bad draw to see, but, you know, they're competitors and they'll be able to get through it. But it's definitely something that you would ideally not want to see in the same group to be forced to play each other so early and uh, potentially prevent one of you from getting to the top 16. But then it goes on. And then we have Nero the Boxer being pulled into this group, who is a longtime ball rock player back in Street Fighter V. Rock and DJ now out of Peru. Lashar, top KOF player, now playing Chun-Li in Street Fighter VI as well and qualified out of Korea, super stacked region. So Lashar definitely did big things there in Korea. and then. Ending Walker. Ending Walker, the 17-year-old prodigy who burst onto the scene in, in 2022, the final season of Street Fighter V, by winning UFA after dominating the UK online scene and then moving on to Capcom Cup to get fifth place at the final Street Fighter V Capcom Cup, only losing to Mena RD, the reigning only two-time Capcom Cup champion, and Idom, the previous Capcom Cup champion. So Super Prodigy player, Mena RD and Ending Walker are in the same group. What is going on here? Like these two players have proved to be the best of the best of the best, and they have to play in group stages already. But, you know, you might be saying to yourself, it can't get any worse than that. Well, let's just watch what happens next. No, 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 that's not what that I mean. was on Rob TV. Oh my Nachi god. Kun in group D, which no. means Angry Bird is going to be in group F along with Meta RD. Kaba, Nero the Boxer, Lashar, and Ending Walker. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to right now apologize formally on behalf of me and Ren. Yeah. This is the lowest moment of our career. Absolutely. As talent, as, as casters, 100%. as members of the fighting game community. I've never been lower than I am right now. Group F. I love how Rob and Ringe recognize it and unabashedly, uh, you know, they, they, they immediately brush their hands in the situation and let it be known to the viewers at home that yes, they are as shocked and appalled at what they're seeing as you guys are as well. Group F has Mena RD, the uh, runner up to Evo, the Street Fighter League USA champion, the most winningest player in the CPT offline season who finally qualified out of the US East World Warrior and Angry Bird, his rivalry throughout this entire season the Evo champion, the runner-up to Street Fighter League USA, who lost last game, last round to Meta RD, are pulled into the same group. So why does this matter? If you're not familiar with the format, the group stages play out over several days, three days straight. 
they do a few matches from each group each day. At the end of the group stages, where all players play each other within the group, the players with the top two records move on to the top 16. One person with the best record goes to winners, one goes to losers. So there's a high chance that one of these players or both potentially don't even make it into the top 16. And on top of that, one of them is guaranteed to be in losers no matter what. You can't have two people in winners. So two people who were favored to meet in grand finals are not likely to have that happen whatsoever. It's kind of like having, uh, you know, so I saw someone on Twitter post this, which I thought was a very, very apt comparison. Having Prime Ali and Prime Mike Tyson play in an undercard boxing match before the main event. It's a match that is likely to be lost in the sauce of 12 plus hours of matches that are happening over three plus days and to not be as significant as it's supposed to be and a first to two set rather than first to three like it would be in the uh, the top 16 bracket. So it, it's just disappointing to see Mena and uh, Angry Bird. They have been going back and forth with historic sets this season. Angry Bird, of course, winning in EVO Grand Finals over Mena RD. Mena RD coming from losers on a historic run and resetting the bracket and taking him to the final set. Then this moment at Street Fighter League USA. Uh, no one was expecting Team Bandits to take it, but Mena RD duped it out with Angry Bird into this final perfect parry on the fireball check into the full combo conversion. Last game, last round, taking it over uh, Team Nasser and Angry Bird there. So they've just been going back and forth for the biggest titles you could possibly have in this CPT season. And like I mentioned before, these two players in my theoretical points edition, if we had granted points like a 2019 season to all these big offline events we had, the big four offline events I ranked here was EVO 2023, Gamers 8, CPT Singapore, and CPT France. If you rank the players from this, Angry Bird would be number one in the world, and Mena RD would be number two in the world, and they're in the same group. So it's just really sad to see that the most prominent storylines that we had for this entire season, which is these two players and their rivalry, rivalry, we expected to see this potentially go all the way to the limit to potentially have these two players in grand finals. But this storyline will get cut short and kind of snuffed out in an anticlimactic way because of the way these groups are structured. Now, there is still a chance that, you know, they could actually potentially meet. One gets out in winners, one gets out in losers, and they meet in the grand finals that way. That is a potential chance, but it just means that their first interaction is going to be much more anticlimactic and not have as big of an impact as it could have, and also runs the risk of just eliminating the storyline right away. I mean, there's a chance that any Walker makes it out of that group. Lashar, Nero, you don't know what's going to happen in these group stages. So the other argument people make here is, well, this doesn't seem very fair. If you look at other groups here, I mean, people would argue that other groups are significantly less stacked and have far less competitive uh, competition and competitive players in them. And uh, no disrespect, but I'm inclined to agree, right? The way the format works by having players from all regions join in, it means that not every player is necessarily the best in the world or the best in their region. If you look back to previous Capcom Cup brackets, for example, 2019, 50% of the qualifiers through that point system, if you look at these, uh, these point systems here, the top 32 players, 50% of them are from Japan. But based on the format in 2022 and 2023, because it's region locked, there's only two players that can qualify through Japan. We got three because one of them, uh, Gachi Kun, won the offline qualifier. But, you know, it, it basically means they're limited to around two players. So, uh, in a traditional point system, uh, usually you'd have a lot more players from certain regions dominating the competition because those regions are stronger. Now, there's other arguments to be, be made. Like, yes, there's definitely regions that are underrepresented and don't have as much access to the CPT tournaments. So, therefore, they are limited in opportunities. And that is true. And uh, there's definitely players who have qualified through these other, uh, you know, uh, online events who have made big splashes, players like Vega Patch and even Ending Walker. Ending Walker qualified through online tournaments and he got fifth place at Capcom Cup last year. Vega Patch qualified out of Spain for his region, ended up beating Kawano and getting seventh place. So it's not like these players don't make an impact. However, there's definitely, definitely an argument to be made that it hurts the level of competition overall in the final product for Capcom Cup. And because it's, there's no seeding, because you can't do any proper seeding because there's no intermingling of the competition, they have to do this random drawing, you end up in situations where some of the best players are forced to eliminate each other early, while potentially weaker players who would not have made it out of the, that group are able to proliferate and go on further. 
So why does this matter? So I would like to defer to this amazing video from Core A Gaming. This video is criminally underrated and I highly recommend everyone who's interested in this topic to watch this video to understand why seeding works and why the format of a tournament matters. Because to answer the question of who's the best is actually a very complex and difficult question that is constrained by many factors, including some that aren't just about competitive integrity, right? There's logistical factors. We have to finish this in time. You know, there's a, there's a physical capacity of a, a venue and there's time constraints that we have to meet. And, you know, there's also the entertainment factor. Like, why do we even do tournaments in the first place? Uh, determining who's the best is definitely part of it, but we also have to get the job done and entertain people in the process. So balancing these these pillars, competitive integrity uh, with entertainment, with logistics, is the balancing act that tournaments are taking. So seeding is a big part of that. So quick thought exercise, like why does seeding matter? Well, to me, it matters because this is not just a, a tournament for first place. So yes, theoretically, you could put all the best players in one group and the weaker players throughout the rest of the groups. The number one player will make it out of the hardest group and then proceed to dominate the rest of the bracket and win first place. Yes, that, that theoretically could happen. However, in that case, you if you have players one through uh one through six in group in one of the groups, and then the rest of the players are significantly weaker, then second place is a player that would not have even gotten a game potentially in that difficult group. So you're rewarding players who are weaker and punishing players who are stronger potentially. And you know, second place is nothing to scoff at $300,000, right? Like your group highly determines the likelihood of you earning cash, regardless of what your potential skill level is. So having mismatched groups can allow people who are not necessarily as skilled or as talented to go further than they otherwise would have and vice versa, right? And we care about these placings because we award cash prizes to them and there's bragging rights, right? Getting fifth place at Capcom Cup, sure, you weren't the best in the world, but that's something to be proud of, and that's something that we value as a community. Like, we value those placings. There's merit to be had there, so we want those placings to be meaningful, so therefore we need valid seeding to make the uh, additional placings beyond first have any meaning to them. Um, and beyond that, the entertainment factor. I just want to see the storylines progress. When we have the best players consistently meeting on a climbing scale of action, it leads to climactic moments. While it is fun to have blowups and upsets early on in brackets, the primary the, the primary storylines generally come from players who have been consistently performing over a long period of time, and we want to see the, that rising culmination of action, action meet at the peak of the summit. Having the two champions play early on completely shorts that uh, that momentum and that culmination from occurring. The two-time Capcom Cup champion being forced to play the Evo champion that he got second to that year and are the two most consistent players in the entire world, forcing them to play into groups undercuts an entire year of story building that we've been fortunate enough to have in this kind of gimped format because it's been all online, so the hype hasn't been there. Every time we've had offline events, we see Mena doing work or we saw the uh, Mena and, and Angry Bird going back and forth. So generally, you want to continue that storyline and not undercut it. And like I mentioned before, if you look at the schedule, it's a brutal schedule. Uh, once you get to the group stages, it's basically going to be like 10 plus hours of matches. So it's very easy to get lost in the sauce and lose context to what matches matter because they play a few matches from each group each day. And it's hard to know when the matches start to matter because there's a certain mathematical point where players are unable to qualify or, or guaranteed to qualify. So you end up having lame duck matches and it's hard to tell which matches matter. Some people play just for the hell of it at a certain point because not their player can qualify so it really can end up making a mena rd versus angry bird matchup not mean too much in the long run so what do the players themselves have to say about this while the rest of the community and myself are kind of dooming about it well angry bird here says this it's always an honor playing my habibi no matter what's the result don't forget guys the reason we play fighting games is to have fun first so let's have fun habibis and mena rd himself says okay let's do this mi hermano kaba mi habibi <laughs> Angry Bird, may the best player in the world get out of this pool and win everything. Challenge accepted. Dominican Republic, Bandits Gaming. So the players are taking it in stride after swallowing a, a pretty tough pill to swallow. What is my take on all this? Well, at the end of the day, I still will enjoy Capcom Cup. I think the LCQ will be a lot of fun. I think the matches will be great. And even if Mena RD or Angry Bird or neither of them make it out of that group, I still think we'll have phenomenal 
uh, games in the top 16 and whoever wins the million dollars, it's going to be a historic moment regardless of the outcome. However, I just feel like this is a culmination of a year that was kind of fumbled from the post release and the CPT format. I understand in 2022, we did primarily online for regional representation and because we lost a lot of our tournament infrastructure due to COVID and we hadn't uh, recovered as a community, as a world from uh, COVID. And that's still kind of the case today. However, we do have a lot more access to all offline events that Capcom and the Pro Tour don't seem to be leveraging. And I think it shows. I think the lack of offline representation, even though the online events are legitimate, the netcode is good, and the competition is fierce. It's lacking the human element. It's lacking putting faces to names and seeing the crowd reaction and feeling the aura of an offline event. And that leads to viewer disinterest and less hype over time. And I think the community has really been feeling it. And we were looking forward for Capcom Cup to kind of restore that, but it's already kind of taken some missteps. People are, are disappointed that there's a lack of news on content uh, updates from capcom at this event entirely so they're relying on solely the competition and now the competition is looking kind of wonky because they can't do seating because they don't do offline events that have the world come together to compete to properly rank people which leads to a weird random group drawing so there's a bunch of small things that are adding up to make this feel a little bit disappointing at the end of the day i'm still very fortunate that we have a million dollar tournament to compete in for street fighter I love Street Fighter, I love fighting games, I love the FGC, and I love the competition and the passion for the players, so I'm still extremely grateful for that to be occurring. It's just disappointing to know how great it could have been. It still would be great, but it could have been greater. And that's all I have for this video. Let me know your thoughts on this, and I'll catch you guys in the next one. Peace.